Oh, well, Quibi is shutting down six months after launching its short-form streaming service. Quibi founder and chairman Jeffrey Katzenberg and CEO Meg Whitman join us now. Now, Quibi was a historic bet on a new type of content, and its shuttering just six months after launch is a dramatic failure for this. Jeffrey and Meg, you did come on CNBC to announce the company's launch, and we appreciate you joining us now to talk about this decision. Meg, I want to start with you. Why did you decide to shut down Quibi now rather than at the first signs of problems with adoption or rather than wait and continue to try for longer? Well, first of all, we're glad to be back. We did uh, launch Quibi with you, uh, Julia, and we're, we're uh, glad to be back today. So we, um, over the summer, we had a very successful launch, and over the summer, we started to see a slowdown in our momentum, and we tried many different things, many different product and packaging models. We changed our marketing. We um, changed the, the app around many different times, but it was clear that uh, for whatever reason, this was not going to be as successful as Jeffrey and I had hoped. And so we took stock of where we were and we said the best thing to do, the honorable thing to do is to return money to shareholders um, when we knew this was not going to have a path forward as a viable standalone business. So we feel like we made the right decision, a very difficult decision, but the right one for shareholders. Certainly, this must be very hard for both of you. You both put your own money in. You also have personal relationships with many of the people that you went to to invest in Quibi. Jeffrey, of course, you have longstanding relationships with all of the media giants that you um, brought on as an investor in Quibi. Uh, how, how are you handling this, Jeffrey, in terms of the bet that you got all these companies that you've known for so long to make on your on your startup? Well, thanks, Julia. I, you know, in the end, I think all you can do, uh, all we can do is own it. You know, we are so appreciative of the opportunity to go pursue this really, really big idea. Uh, for sure, you know, there was risk involved in it, but I think all of us expected uh, a much better outcome, a much bigger outcome from this. And, you know, to our investors, to our studio partners, you know, we are grateful, thankful for them uh, giving this opportunity and letting us do it. And in the end, I think what, you know, as Meg said, uh, at this point, when we have seen that it does not have a, a, a future for it, um, the best thing we can do is return as much money to, uh, to them as we can and uh, take care of our employees in the best way possible. Now, I, I want to get in, into this idea of returning money to investors later, but first I really want to understand what you think went wrong here. Meg, you said you had a very strong launch, but the reality is, is even though many people downloaded the app, when it came to converting those people to being paying subscribers, that was much more challenging. I've seen some reports that less than 10% of people who did a free trial converted to paying. And I'm wondering if you can help me identify what you think really went wrong here, because we have really seen other short form mobile content thrive during COVID, whether it's Snap that reported a 50% increase in time spent watching shows or TikTok growing rapidly. Jeffrey, do you think it was the subscription model that was really so problematic? Listen, I think it's a convergence of a, a of a number of things, Julia. So yes, we had a new uh, a new product. Um, we asked people to pay for it before they actually understood what it was. Um, uh, I, I think we thought there would be easier uh, ad uh, adoption by people uh, to it. Um, I think that the environment that we found ourselves in, as you've heard us say many times, this was designed for on the go, in between at a moment in time in which no one was on the go, they're still not on the go. And um, so our product market fit was wrong. I mean, somewhere between the idea being less than perfect, which we we own and the environment we found ourselves in uh, is where the fail has come. How much is, you know, what, what each of those are in that equation, I'm not sure any of us are ever gonna know, but it, it, it didn't work. You know, having said that, Meg, I will um, say I mean, content that was made is something, you know, that we are quite proud of and I think has been actually really, really well received. I'm sorry. No, no, Jeffrey, I, was, I actually was going to reference something you now famously told the Times uh, back in the spring, and that was I attribute everything that's gone wrong to coronavirus, everything. Um, w would you temper that statement now? A hundred percent. It's not fair. I mean, it was a little bit of a, you know, of a, you know, just a clippy answer to, you know, a flippant answer at the time in it. But 
you know, other companies have faced the challenges of COVID and they've managed to find a path to put in. So, you know, I think Meg and I believe in, you know, owning our myths and uh, simply blaming it on COVID, uh, you know, I don't think is, is, is fair and not something that either of us uh, want to do. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.